Once a Pacific paradise that knew nothing but peace, the Solomons has descended to the brink of collapse. If the government and his friends fail to uh, solve this problem, then you have the eventual, the effect, uh, the eventual breakup of the country, possibly into six separate nations. This is a clash over land and culture, a tribal conflict with modern weapons, whose warriors mix magic with gangster rap. We want our demands to be met by the government. We want the government to pay for our lands, our, our compensation for our land, and our, uh, we've got compensation for our properties and our lives. I'm only making all the boys to become aggressive, rise up, take our arms and go back to the battlefield. And at this point in time, we are preparing for war. Yeah? As a nation, the Solomon Islands were thrown together as an afterthought of retreating British colonialism. Its hope lay in two main islands, Malaita, under-resourced yet overpopulated, and Guadalcanal, with its fertile land and the nation's capital. But deep cultural differences for years ignored have today flared into bloody conflict. It looks like any other Pacific town, but here in Honiara there's one big difference. Most of the people are from the island of Malaita, and they're trapped here by Guadalcanal militants who are manning checkpoints around the city and vow to kill any Malaitans who venture out. The capital of the Solomon Islands has itself become an island in a sea of ethnic hatred. Honiara's suburbs are small villages of Malaitan squatters, refugees in their own country, vulnerable to attack from the tightening noose of Guadalcanal militancy. Travelling here to the city's outskirts would be suicide for a Malaitan. This is the front line of Guadalcanal militancy. Hello. Hey, what's up? Let's come here. Hello, we're here for the Guadalcanal meeting. This afternoon? Yeah, we're just uh, going through to the Guadalcanal How meeting. How do you know about the meeting? Uh, we've been talking to some of the leaders up in the town. And, and they've invited us to come up. So they, they say One of the militant leaders, George Gray, has been expecting me that we need the broader approval of his men to pass. After see the boys, if the boys are good, then you can, I mean, you can proceed. Okay, fair enough. Otherwise, you will have to be them back here. I understand. They call themselves the Isatambu Freedom Movement. Isatambu, meaning sacred place, is their word for the island of Guadalcanal. Their preferred weapons are homemade guns that take powerful 50 caliber bullets left behind in World War II ammunition dumps across the island. But they have others. Even some modern military weapons like M16s and this, this large. These ones look like sort of World War II or something. This is a palm action shotgun. Mm -hmm. It's with these weapons the IFM cleansed their countryside of Malaitans, people they accused of stealing their land. Even those who had paid for the land were not spared the militant reassertion of traditional ownership. As a good economic man, the land is still mine. Whether, I sell, whether you acquire the land legally from me or not, the land is still mine. So when I, whenever I want to chase you out from the land, I have all the right. Peace be with you. Peace be with you. Peace. For more than 30 years, Archbishop Adrian Smith has watched the tension grow. There's been a long build-up of resentment amongst Guadalcanal people because of the large number of Malaita people who have migrated here to find work. And Malaita is a less fertile island, and to feed your family on Malaita, you have to work harder than you do on Guadalcanal. And that kind of 
they brought that characteristic with them and so they moved here and they were aggressive in uh, getting things moving. It's a clash with roots in the carnage of World War II. Malaitans first came to Guadalcanal to help the Americans build Henderson Airfield, the reason for the site of today's national capital, Honiara. Most of them stayed. But the war left another deadly legacy. Hundreds, possibly thousands of arms and ammunition dumps across the islands now being used by the militants on both sides to fight today's war. In Honiara, the Malaitans are digging in and fighting back. This is the Malaitan Eagle Force. Like the Guadalcanal militants, until this week they've been outlawed, so cover their faces to avoid arrest. They've armed not just to defend themselves, but to win what in Malaitan culture is demanded. Payback and compensation for Guadalcanal land the Malaitans were forced off. But it's the money we need to begin our lives, because actually the whole thing throughout this tension is that our lives have been fucking ripped off. And we want a total guarantee, the government would guarantee us a compensation for what we need, like our properties, yeah, and our lives, and so forth. Their bill, 170 million Solomon Island dollars. An impossible sum for a government of an impoverished Pacific nation. It's a sum made all that much harder when the tension has brought the economy to its knees. Once employing 2,000 Malaitans, this palm oil plantation used to produce a fifth of the nation's GDP. Militants chase them off, closing it down until they get the jobs themselves. High above Honiara, the Australian-owned Gold Ridge Gold Mine is now the only major foreign investment left in the Solomons. Its operation is totally at the mercy of the Guadalcanal militants, who so far accept its deal with local landowners, but have insisted that all Malaitans leave their jobs here. It's the kind of long-term demand that angers the eagles and undermines chances of a long-term peace. They have been killing, you know, innocent civilians, for example, and we've been giving them chances to solve this, like the government to step in, but the government won't do it. If the compensation doesn't come, is this thing going to get worse? For sure it would. It would go on until we've come to the final stage where we would surely have to go to the end. It all started because of the land. The land is your mother. It is your life. This is where we are given birth. This is where we live and this is where we will die. Commanding the unquestioning loyalty of his men, IFM Supreme Commander Andrew T comes from the other side of the island, an unforgiving strip of land known as the Weather Coast. Undeveloped and largely untouched by the modern world, it's from there the cult of Guadalcanal nationalism first arose. It's a cult whose foot soldiers wear bark armour and believe specially blessed sticks protect them from bullets. The Malaitans, they come, they do not respect the land. They do not respect everything that is created and put in this land. That is the main cause of the problem. It was the frustration of the Weather Coast people who came and started driving these Malaita people out and then the people on this side of the island became part of the movement, the militancy, the young people. And uh, there are so many young people with nothing to do. So a school dropout, standard six, now has a homemade gun and he's able to go up to your house at 12 o'clock at night and say, clear out. He suddenly has a new sense of It's very of dangerous power. though, isn't it? It's very dangerous. Uh, me still think that government have no follow me thing, blame me. 
For Guadalcanal politicians like Seth Yul Kelly, it comes down to a tribal right to say who does what on their island. I think the issue is that we want some kind of autonomy to be given to the provinces so that people can make down laws. Now the a key demand for Guadalcanal to control immigration has, he says, been ignored by successive governments since independence. It's question of protection to people, so we need a legislation. We cannot do that with the present system unless we amend the law so as to give power to people to decide their destiny. But while politicians talk, the militants are making their own decisions. Dressing in traditional kabilatu as a mark of identity and spiritual protection, Guadalcanal militants tighten their net around Honiara. And Westside Commander JD won't rule out going further if their demands are not met. This Honiara is just like in the middle of our hand. I mean, we just carry it. And if our answer to the government is not well answered, it's easily for us to close our hands inside town because this is the whole island that is surrounding watching what the government is doing. And if nothing is happening, then we just clean up on here. I mean, the water, we have the power to close the water. We have the power to close the electricity. And that's the time when we'll try to chase out these Malaitans. What they don't have in land the Malayan eagles make up for with better weapons than their Guadalcanal enemies, military-style training and powerful connections. There are high-level Malayans in Honiara, in both the commercial and government sectors, who are highly sympathetic uh, towards the, the, the Eagle Force members and who may be colluding with them in, uh, in an organised ma manner, but uh, in a hidden form. Malayan lawyer Andrew Norrie is the conduit for Eagle Force statements. A former MP who won't rule out running in next year's elections, today he's trying to convince the Eagles to attend peace talks on the neutral Isabel Island. So we come normal for finding them out. If you follow like him, take part. Let us follow peace discussions or no more. But fearing arrest under a decree banning them and their enemies as illegal societies, they refuse. Yeah, there are still some uh, conditions that the government have to be met with. And uh, for sure, we won't attend the peace talks down at Boala. In a measure of their growing power, the Eagles scuttle the talks by threatening any Malayan who attends without them. None did. Within days, militant politics forces the Prime Minister to lift the ban so both groups can at least talk but he rejects their demands for a blanket amnesty. Well, they broke the law. You see, if we, if we pardon all of them, yeah, uh, like some of the critics are saying, you are setting a very dangerous legal precedent for the future. Yeah? The next place to rise is Western province. Yeah? Because in the Western province, there were more Malaitan on it than Gualcana. With no army, it's the police who are meant to be keeping the peace between the two warring armies. But with just a few hundred active officers, it's an impossible, dangerous job. We don't feeling, I mean, we don't feel very secure in Navia. Yeah? Unless we, we have good training with good weapons, that will not secure us. And, but otherwise, we don't have much, you know. And there's a much deeper problem with the police. In today's Solomons, it's not the police badge that comes first, but where you come from, and the police are divided. Malayan police are accused of aiding and arming their relatives in the Malayan Eagle Force. Guadalcanal police accused of helping the IFM. 20 years after independence. Even the man charged by the Commonwealth with brokering a peace Fijian strongman Major General Sitiveni Rambuka admits ethnic allegiances override police impartiality. They'll be limited, they'll be restricted because of the, the, the strong cultural ties that they have. On both sides? On both sides. If we had a police force that is a, 
uh, so professional that it has, doesn't have those cultural and uh, uh, traditional sensitivities, then we would have no problem. Unfortunately, the police is a reflection of society. Well, in a situation where law and order can no longer be upheld, where there's a breakdown in, the, in police networking, in the police firepower, the situation will give rise to, um, to um, criminal elements and the two militant groups taking control of their various sectors. And um, in the end, we will have a major confrontation between the two militant organizations supported by their own supporters. So a civil war um, is not um, a remote possibility. It, it is a possibility, in fact, a probability. It's the day of the Isabel Island peace talks, but just outside Honiara, there's little peace to discuss. Malayan eagles have just shot up this village. It's a provocative action with a political message. No eagles, no talks. In response, 200 Guadalcanal militants have now moved their frontline checkpoint to within a few minutes of the city. We try to respect the peace talk which is going on up one, but the Malayan eagles are creating some problems here, so we have to come here and take care of our people. While we're here, the militants spot a truck. If the driver had been Malayton, he would have been killed on the spot. The IFM agrees that many of its demands are being addressed through a constitutional review, but say they're now defending themselves against Malayton Eagle attack. While people are dying, Back in his office, the Prime Minister blames the renewed violence on a political conspiracy to bring him down. Who's behind the politics of this and why? Well, those, as you would know, those who would like to be in power uh, for their own uh, reasons, uh, they would like to see this ethnic tension uh, driving to the next coming election. Those kind of allegations, you know, are insult to injury. Um, for Malaitans especially, their, their, their demand is, is purely a property demand. Uh, demand for justice. A demand for re-establishment of, uh, of uh, their constitutional right to remain on Kulokanal where they acquired property. In the meantime, peace or war is in the hands of the men with guns. With the ban lifted, they may agree to a temporary ceasefire, but they will not disarm. Meet the demands first, then all the surrendering of the arms. We'll just give it ourselves. Do, uh, we do not need the government or the police to come and collect now. We will give it ourselves. How important is an amnesty for you guys before you can proceed? At the moment, we see amnesty it's good, but it needs some kind of good investigation inside. Because for us, we personally believe that the Ingle Force were formed by or held by some police officers. So we want the government to do something. It's the grave of my brother, Davidson. Mourned by his village, Davidson Maru died a horrifyingly symbolic death simply because he was from Guadalcanal. So he was then stolen and stamped, then they chopped his, his head down, uh, off. We pray that you will accept his soul. Abducted from outside a nightclub, he was decapitated, his headless body dumped in Honiara's main market. I pray, O oh Lord, that may his soul rest in peace. Davidson was the first to die here in this way in more than a hundred years. But as both sides dig in for difficult demands on a backdrop of revenge killings and a new election, he probably won't be the last. Pray and ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.